How can he convict me of something I no longer possess? Well, Mike, you're saying you're not perfect. No, I, I, no. what he convicts me of is, Mike, you're better than this. Mike, you have the righteousness of Christ. You don't need to be doing that. Mike, you missed the mark. Remember, remember our, our sermon about the arrow? Mike, you, you need to change your stance a little. You're missing the target. He will, and, and, and I, as a Christian, I'm still going to mourn sometimes when, when the Holy Spirit goes, uh, you know when you did that? Oh, man, you're right. But I'm no longer trying to earn my salvation by fixing my behavior. Because if fixing my behavior would have worked, Jesus would not have had to have come and died on the cross. But it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to work for me, and it wasn't going to work for you. And it wasn't going to work for that one aunt you have that no matter what, says, you know, it's like, oh, if anybody was going to save herself, it would have been my aunt. But it, no. Finally, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. Just like Jesus, the Spirit only said what the Father said, he doesn't bring a different me- measure. Okay, so... Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. If we walk by the Spirit, guess what? We, we want what the Spirit wants. We stop wanting what the flesh wants, and we start wanting what the Spirit wants. And what happens to our sin life? It just begins to go down and go down and go down. It's like, you know, I used to do this, I used to do that, but now it's like, I'm, I'm really more interested in, I'm really more interested in this, and I'm really more interested in this. I'm more interested in the things of God, and, and I've just kind of lost my appetite for the things of the world. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing as he brings us through this, this sanctification process that he does. Um, then, uh, then we find a very important thing on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is a powerful day in the lives of all of us who are redeemed. So let me see if I can keep up with this. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them uh, tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. This this experience, it's the only time we should expect the big whirlwind. Hear me out. Because we know that most of the time the Holy Spirit speaks to us in the still, small voice. How many of y'all would like for him to yell at us, with the, with the mega horn every once in a while. Okay, God, if you would just be the absolute loudest voice in my head just this one time, that would be really good. And it, we see it here, and so I think sometimes we think, oh, man, we wish he would do that again. I, I'm, I think if we had that happen, we might go, well, okay, you know, let's, let's not do the whirlwind thing again. Once was enough. But we see this power. Well, what happens? Now, what would happen if we were sitting here, and all of a sudden... We had that Pentecost experience. You know, we'd n- nobody had ever had it before, and we have it in here at Gateway Christian Center, and boom, the doors fly open, and, and everything is flying around, and, and all this power, we feel all this power. Well, we look back at Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the most remote part of the earth. Did they... Indeed, when the Holy Spirit came, did they indeed experience what they'd been told they were going to experience? Yes. They had boldness and they had power. They went from hiding in the house to going out in the street and going, we got to tell somebody about Jesus. We've lost that in our culture. It's like, we got to tell just I gotta find the right person to tell about Jesus. I gotta, I'm gonna look in for that one person who's really, they look really happy anyways. And I wanna go to that unhappy person. I wanna tell them about Jesus. I'm hoping they already know Jesus because, you know, these, these folks went out and we know there, was, there were all these people from all over that were, that were there in, in the streets and they went out to them. And, and remember, we're only talking about about 20 people. Now, here's the thing. Is it easier to be bold when you're in a group of 20 or when you're by yourself? It's always easier to be bold when you're with somebody else. Yet, so many Christians do everything they can do to avoid other Christians 
Uh, maybe a little bit on Sunday. Maybe I'll hang out with a Christian on Sunday. Especially the crazy Christians, and you know who you are. We, you know, but, but if, you, if you lack boldness, go find somebody who's bold and handcuff yourself to them and go, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not very bold, but you're very bold, so I'm going to handcuff myself to you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live off of your boldness. And trust me, those crazy people will throw away the key, and they will keep you right there. So here we are, the second chapter of Acts, 20 to 30 people, they go out, Peter preaches a simple message. Where did that simple message come from? Well, we've already figured out. The Holy Spirit spoke through him, and 3,000 people go, I need that, I, I need that. Does anybody think that at this point, Peter had, uh, had gone to a, uh, one of those uh, courses, you know, um, uh, who's, the, who's the shoe salesman that uh, became the great speaker? Uh, whatever, yeah, it, obviously nobody knows. So he changed my life. I'll never forget that guy. He hadn't, he hadn't gone to any of those classes. He hadn't, he hadn't been sitting there writing out this message. He went out, he opened his mouth, God, the Holy Spirit filled his mouth. He used this simple message and the people responded. Let me take the pressure off of you. People are not going to respond to your message. They're going to respond to the Holy Spirit's message. They're going to respond to the Holy Spirit's message. So then we move on a little bit more. Another advantage um, to the Holy Spirit, we find this in Romans. Sorry, I'm in Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he uh, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You have the greatest prayer partner you could ever have in the Holy Spirit. Because not only does he know what's going on in you, he knows what's going on in heaven. He knows how to connect you and God in a way that nothing else, nothing else can connect you. He is our intercessor. But he not only intercedes for us. Sometimes we get this impression, okay, I'm going to say something. He's going to intercede it to God. That's awesome. God says something to me. It's the Holy Spirit who's interceding what God's saying to me. And I know sometimes it gets confusing with the whole three, three in one and all that. But, but this is what the scripture says. This is a double-sided door. It helps us communicate with the Father, and it helps us understand what the Father is communicating to us. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who uh, works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and another is given the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, and another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And another, the effecting of miracles, and another, prophecy, and another, distributing of spirits. To another, uh, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. The Holy Spirit is the spiritual gift giver, and he doesn't leave anybody off the list. Uh, I I loved how, in in one one of the things that David was saying about our preparation, about what's going to be your part in it. Um, If Callie will remind me, one day this week, soon, you'll get an email and it's going to have a link. How many of y'all have ever done a spiritual gifts inventory before? Because I'm going to, we're going to send you that, and we're going to ask you, hey, would you click on here and do it? Teenagers, how long did it take? It's like 90 questions or something like that. They did one on paper or something. It's 100 questions or something. Like just when you have like 20 minutes, you'll sit down and just do it on the computer or whatever, and then you're going to email your result to me. And then I'm going to go, wow, this person has the gift of mercy. This person has the gift of miracles. This person has the gift of tongues. This person has the gift of healing. And then, see, it helps us know. It's like, oh, you know what? What I need in this time, I need a mercy person, so I'm going to go to Jill. 
I'm just, Jill's not a really mercy person. I'm just throwing that out. Not that she's not merciful, but yeah, I, let me move on before I hurt myself further. You're going to be getting an email. You're going to fill that out if you will. Because we know something's coming. Are we going to be ready for it? We want to be ready for it. We want to be ready for whatever it is that the Lord's going to be doing. So um, there, there's one spirit. He's assigned gifts to you and to me for what? For the common good. Not to build my kingdom, not to build your kingdom, but to build his kingdom. Uh, some questions uh, can't be answered about, you know, why does he give you one gift and give me another gift? And why, how many gifts does he give? And I, I think that he, might, he may exchange gifts with you at some point. It's his, it's his plan, and I'm his, I'm his, you know, vessel. He can do whatever he wants, and, and I'm okay with that. If we give gifts based on our knowledge of our children, how many of y'all, it's, you know, you're already beginning to think about Christmas, you know? And you're thinking, okay, my wife, uh, uh, I always get Sally, you know, something, pots or pans or something. I'm just kidding, because I know her, and I know not to do that. So if, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does the Heavenly Father know to give you good gifts? He's going to give you a good gift. Trust me. And some of you, he's given multiple gifts, and that's cool. So uh, then, then we find in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You are a house. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, Eli got to move in to uh, the apartment Friday, okay? And soon, you know, he and Emma will be living there. And... Uh, I would imagine, I don't know because I haven't been there, I would imagine you're trying to make the place nice. So, you know, yeah. Uh, so far, you know. You know, you, 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 for, if, for those of you, some of you ladies, you know the cleaning lady is coming on Thursday, so you're up late Wednesday night cleaning it so that when the cleaning lady gets there, you know, I don't want her to think that we're dirty people or whatever. We prepare a place, okay? So the Holy Spirit lives in me. How clean do I want me to be for the Holy Spirit to feel really, really comfortable? We had Bethany spend the night at our house last night. When they got there, I actually had on pajamas. Just, I just wanted you to know. I had pajamas on. I wasn't dressed like I would normally be because I knew I was going to have guests. I wanted the guests to feel comfortable, not weirded out. We're the temple of the Most High God. The Holy Spirit, He chooses to dwell in us. He doesn't go, oh, man, I don't want to live in that guy. Oh, I hate that guy. I don't want to live in that guy. He chooses to live in you. That's pretty powerful. So if, if we, uh, there's, some, there's some other scriptures. We're not even going to go through them. Uh, I never intended to, so just so you know. 1 Corinthians 2, he brings revelation and wisdom. Ephesians 1, he seals us in our salvation. How secure am I in my salvation? Well, let's see. The Holy Spirit of God is my super glue. What can separate me from God? Nothing. Because what clings me to God is God. Is there anything that can rip God's hands apart from me? No. Galatians 5. He sanctifies us and makes us bear fruit. And he loves to make us bear fruit because it brings joy. Romans 8, he gives us the spirit of adoption and belonging. When, you're, when you belong, you don't, you don't do all the stuff you can to try to earn it. I got to try to earn it. I got to try to earn it. I don't want to get kicked out. I don't want to get kicked out. You relax in the fact that I ain't getting kicked out. That's the, that's the spirit of adoption and belonging. Titus 3, he gives us the spirit of rebirth and renewal. And it's fresh every day. And I remember that one time I was <laughs> renewed. It's, it can happen all the time, okay? So the Holy Spirit can do these things. The Holy Spirit can have an impact on the physical like, life, like he did with Mary. The Holy Spirit can speak to us in times of trial in ministry and through us. The Holy Spirit always speaks truth about the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit keeps us connected to the Father, and he keeps that connection strong and fully open.